Like the office they commemorate, presidential libraries are living institutions. Certainly it is my hope that the Reagan Library will become a dynamic intellectual forum where scholars interpret the past and policymakers debate the future. Welcome to the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute's virtual event series. To fulfill President Reagan's mission of making the Reagan Library a dynamic intellectual forum, our Center for Public Affairs Programming offers lectures and forums presenting perspectives on important public policy issues of the day. Each year, we bring you 20 to 30 events from politicians, authors, members of the media, business and military leaders, and more. Since the March 2020 closure of many businesses across our great country, the Reagan Foundation is now bringing its events online to ensure that we are still delivering world-class content, even if you can't get to our hilltop to watch it in person. In this week's Center for Public Affairs virtual event, we invite you to join us for a conversation with number one New York Times bestselling author and award-winning journalist, Sebastian Younger, for his new book, Freedom. Sebastian Younger is well known for his best-selling books, The Perfect Storm and War, as well as for his Academy Award nominated documentary, Restrepo. In his latest book, Freedom, Sebastian Younger examines the tension that lies at the heart of what it means to be human. For much of a year, Younger and three friends, a conflict photographer and two Afghan war vets, walked the railroad lines of the East Coast. It was an experiment in personal autonomy, but also in interdependence. Dodging railroad cops, sleeping under bridges, cooking over fires, and drinking from creeks and rivers, the four men forged a unique reliance on one another. In Freedom, Younger weaves his account of this journey together with primatology and boxing strategy, the history of labor strikes and Apache raiders, the role of women in resistance movements, and the brutal reality of life on the Pennsylvania frontier. Written in exquisite, razor-sharp prose, the result is a powerful examination of the primary desire that defines us. We now invite you to enjoy our virtual program, coming to you from our Air Force One Pavilion Leadership Academy Oval Office with Sebastian Younger and Reagan Foundation and Institute Executive Director, John Highbush. Welcome to the Reagan Library and the Reagan Foundation's program. Today is a, it's an exciting day. Um, we have with us two remarkable guests, um, each in their own way. Uh, I know without a doubt everyone will recognize uh, Sebastian Junger, um, the author of some incredible works from Tribe to War to so many pieces, Vanity Fair, uh, ABC News correspondent, documentary filmmaker Restrepo, uh, and with him someone just as amazing in his own right, uh, General Stan McChrystal. Uh, you can't know anything about what modern warfare if you don't know General McChrystal's name. Uh, the JSOC commander, four star, led our troops in Afghanistan, literally, literally wrote the book on modern warfare, uh, counterterrorism. Uh, two incredible guests, and we're here today to talk about quite a book. Um, this is, I think, Sebastian, this is your latest book. Um, also, really, <laughs> one of the most incredible. I, I just enjoyed this not only because of um, the subject matter but the times we happen to be living in and the relevance I think of this topic to so much of what's happening in America today. So thank you for such a great book and General McChrystal, Stan, thank you for joining us to talk about it. Thank you. Uh, you know I thought we would start before we get into the the fundamental concept behind this book, uh, Sebastian, is if you could give us context, set this up, and, and, and talk essentially about the journey uh, that you took, this really unique journey that uh, I think drove you to, to get into the topic of the book. Yeah, thank you, I, uh, and thank you for your kind words. So some years ago, um, I decided to walk along the railroad lines uh, from Washington, D.C. to Philadelphia to New York with some um, with a couple of combat vets from Afghanistan that I knew and a combat photographer who was with my friend Tim when he died in Libya. He was holding his hand in the back of a rebel pickup truck as, as Tim bled out from a shrapnel wound. Um, 
And we set out to encounter our country and encounter ourselves, both in the most sort of raw, uh, unfiltered way that we could. The railroad lines um, are perfect for that. They go right through the middle of everything. It's not just the Appalachian Trail, which is beautiful. It goes right through the ghettos, right through the suburbs, the farms, the forests. Uh, you get America and America from the inside out. It's this swath of no man's land where you can kind of make your way outside of the scrutiny of society. You, we slept under bridges and in abandoned buildings and we got our water out of creeks. And, um, you know, it's illegal. So we had to sort of keep out of the way of the cops. At one point, uh, I'm pretty sure they had a helicopter looking for us, but we, we, they didn't quite catch us. I feel a little bit bad about that, wasting national resources. Um, but it, we, were, we, we intended well and, and we walked all the we got to Philly and, and decided to turn west and head to Pittsburgh and we crossed Pennsylvania. A lot of it was along the beautiful Juniata River, which I later found out is the only river in Pennsylvania that trends east west and, be, and 250 years ago was a portal to the west for uh, settlers who were leaving the bounds of settled society and heading for what was called Indian Territory. And uh, as I say in the book, um, we walked 400 miles and most nights we were the only people who knew where we were. And there are many definitions of freedom, uh, but surely that's one of them. And I wove that into a more researched account of what, what humans will do, what they can do to maintain their autonomy in the face of a greater power. I wove the account of that trip into my research into uh, hopefully one se seamless and readable little book. Yeah, I, you know, Sebastian and I had the good fortune and somewhat the insanity of when I was 17 and just graduated from high school and a friend of mine and I stuck our thumb out and hitchhiked from Washington, D.C. to Oregon, down the coast of California and back and it took four months and I, you know, what I remember about that trip is I'll never uh, forget it, I'll never regret it, but I'll never do it again. Um, and, and I wondered if you, if you feel the same way in terms of uh, the difficulty. Some, I mean, it's incredible freedom, but sometimes it can also be a difficult task, can't it? Well, I'll tell you a pretty good rule of thumb. The more comfortable and more safe you are, uh, the less autonomous you probably are. The less free yeah. you are. And, yeah. um, you know, safety and comfort come from being embedded in a functional group. And, uh, but if you're embedded in a group, you have to abide by its norms. And the, the, the settlers on the frontier, many of them were um, sort of flee, fleeing a, a, you know, frankly, an oppressive colonial government. Um, some viewed the church as an oppressive force as well. And they wanted to strike out on their, on their own in the wilderness. Of course, they were enormously free out there. And it was also enormously easy to get killed. It was a very bloody time. The Indian Wars were brutal. Both sides were brutal. And so what they found was that in order to survive, they, they basically, they fell into a sort of mutual defense pact with their neighbors. Uh, and when there were sort of Indian raids along the frontier, everyone collected at the stockade and you had to fight, right? Forget about the oppression of the military draft. This was beyond that. Everybody had to fight. Men, women, everybody. And particularly as an adult male, if you did not fight, or even if you did not carry a weapon, a scalping knife, and a tomahawk at all times, because these raids were, you know, out of the blue, you were shunned and ultimately cast out of the community. You did not have the freedom to not fight. So you're never going to be co completely free unless you're alone in the wilderness, and then you're in huge danger. Um, so that said, um, we, you know, one, me and one of the guys, Brendan, we keep going out there. We were out there as recently as a couple of years ago. We loved it out there. Uh, I have two little girls now, um, you know, just for, you know, for that reason, it's, I'm a little less mobile and my life is an awful lot deeper and more meaningful. Um, but um, I absolutely loved it out there. And despite the insects, we were carrying 70 pound packs. We, it was, I mean, a lot of ways it was freaking miserable, right? But that was that feeling of misery you know, often when you feel miserable, is it's connected to being free, right? Like I started to associate those two feelings. Uh, so I got to say, I mean, I, I would go back in a heartbeat. 
Yeah, well, Ed, uh, Stan, I know you are a student of, of, uh, of history. I don't, I don't know if you felt the same way in reading Sebastian's book, but I, I know we're living in the modern times. But as he would say in the book, it's like once you step about 10 feet off of the railroad tracks and found yourself in the woods, I kind of felt like I was a, maybe a Lewis and Clark adventure, uh, which is just remarkably strange, you know, in the modern day to feel as you did, uh, Sebastian, so isolated and somewhat in free in that manner. Yeah, I, I started on two levels. Let me jump on that one because, you know, I started on one guy envying another guy's road trip. And I envied it until you put the needle through the blister and got it infected. And then I said, oh, been there, you know. <laughs> but, but what I took away was Freedom, and, and really it, what you, you get at is freedom's the choice. You were out there being rained on, getting cold, doing all the things you did because you chose to do that. And there's a liberating feeling about the idea that nobody made you do it. You had the opportunity to not do it. And yet it, it, uh, it really gets to the heart of the whole thing. Yeah, well, in, in fact, uh, that, on that exact point, Stan, I'm, I'm going to read a quote from Sebastian's book. He says, over the course of 400 miles, we failed to come up with a single moral or legal justification for what we were doing other than the dilute principle that we weren't causing actual harm, so we should be able to keep doing it. <laughs> it be we do it because we can. It, it kind of seems like Sebastian. Yeah, and we were, you know, we didn't want to get ourselves or into any trouble or get hurt or get anyone else hurt. You know, I mean, you know, we, and we actually really talked about this. And you know, there are laws, and then there's there are moral laws. And we felt that the, although you know, technically illegal because it's trespassing. Um, in fact, there weren't really any actual victims to what we were doing. And so we made, you know, we sort of made made it we made ourselves feel like we were okay. We were actually on the right side of, at least of morality. Um, now the police weren't convinced. Uh, they clearly, you know, there was a few times we had to sort of hunker down in the bushes as the patrol car went by. Um, but we were pretty good at evading the police. And, you know, basically the railroad lines are straight and flat. And if you think someone's looking for you, you just walk at night and everything out there has to have a headlight on it. And that you can see coming a mile off, right? In either direction. And you just step into the underbrush, right? And so, and so it was the the um, sort of evasion challenges out there were were fairly simple, um, pr pretty rudimentary. You just had to stay on your toes. And, some, and during the day, if we were worried someone was going to roll up on us from behind, you know, of course, if we heard a train coming, um, and you could feel them coming before you could hear them or see them. It, they just a mile out. They just changed something in like the molecular structure of the air. I don't know what it was, but you got very we got very attuned to it. You know, you, st you know, engineers have to call you in. So, you know, we would just step into the woods or whatever. And, and but, you know, one time we thought someone was going to might roll up on us from behind. And so basically we had four or five guys in a line walking and we just all randomly look backwards at random intervals. If you have five guys doing that randomly looking behind, the sum total of all that is that no one could no one could sneak up on you. It works extremely well. Uh, yeah, I um Stan, um, you were talking about the concept of freedom, and I thought, you know, if we had 100 different people in this interview and we said define freedom for me, we might get 100 different definitions. And I, I thought it, uh, another quote from uh, your, your, your book, Sebastian, you define freedom in several ways, but I think your most fundamental one was you said, freedom is no one can tell you what to do or how to live my life period, right? And that, that just seemed to me to be, a, you have really distilled it down. Um, and I, I bet you that's the way the average American feels. Yeah, I mean, let me put a slightly finer point on that. No, no one can tell you what to do that, uh, that they, they can't tell you to do something that they themselves don't also have to do. <laughs> right? So paying taxes is not a, 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 um, an intrusion on your freedom because the people that, that work at the IRS the people that write the tax laws, the people that enforce the tax laws, the generals, the, the president, like everybody's got to pay taxes. 
if that were not true, if any of those people didn't have to pay taxes, you could argue that neither do you, right? You can't tell me to do something you don't have to do. To me, that's a very important part of freedom. And the other, the other thing, and it's not in the book, but I've given it a lot of thought even since I finished the book, and then I'll hand it over to Stan. But, um, you know, freedom, the thing we have a right to is freedom from oppre oppression. We don't have a freedom from obligation. We are obligated to our society in precisely which ways is an open discussion, an ongoing discussion, and there's a fair amount of dispute around that. But the fact is we owe something to this collective that in turn owes its best efforts to help us individually. And uh, to think otherwise is to not live in the real world. As I say in the book, only children it's literally in infantile to think you don't owe anything to society. Only children owe nothing. Yeah, I, re I remember that from the book. And uh, Stan, uh, you know, you've led hundreds of thousands out of perhaps millions of soldiers in your career. Uh, do, you, do you think that their definition, if you ask them uh, what freedom is all about, it would be no one can tell me what to do or how to live my life? I think that might seem too simplistic for them because clearly there's a corporal telling you what to do and a sergeant telling them what to do and whatnot, but it's a volunteer military now. So nobody told them they had to put the uniform on. And I would say that I go back to the civil war and I think of the reason so many African Americans joined the union army, the Northern army is because they understood intuitively that their freedom going forward after the war would be impacted by their clear over acceptance of responsibility. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is where it goes hand in hand with what Sebastian was saying. It's not freedom from responsibility, but it's freedom from unfair mm -hmm. uh, oppression, responsibility, that sort of thing that I think matters to mine. Yeah, um, Sebastian, you, you talked about um, one of your reasons for choosing railroad tracks was you don't have to go up a whole lot of hills. You know, it could be kind of flat territory. Uh, but I wondered if you, you, could, you, of course, like you said, you could have just picked the Appalachian Trail and walked your 400 miles, but you chose tracks. And I'm wondering if any of that is because you were challenging the concept of freedom in the sense that you're not supposed to be there. You know, you're trespassing. So there was some, uh, some fear or some prohibition that I wondered if it excited your sense of freedom. Look, it definitely, I mean, I, I won't lie. It definitely appealed to the sort of 10 year old boy in me, right? I mean, like what, what, what kid doesn't want to get away with something? You walk the Appalachian Trail, it's, it's a heroic effort, but you're not getting away with something, right? You're supposed right. to be out there. Uh, but on a more serious note, we wanted to encounter the country, right? We wanted to encounter the people of this land. Um, I, I, I didn't, I, I mean, I love the wilderness. I spent a lot of time in the wilderness, but this time I wanted to be at the heart of the American experience. Um, and that meant every kind of, every kind of society, black, white, rich, poor, industrial, farm, suburb, everything. And um, there was an interesting sort of tactical challenge of staying uh, below the radar, out of sight, getting, uh, you know, figuring out how to get uh, clean drinking water in a sort of mixed use environment. Uh, we had a water filter pump, but that didn't even protect us. We drank the Yokogany River downstream from Connellsville and, uh, uh, or is it upstream? I can't remember. At any rate, I was fine, but my buddy got, was sick for a week, right? And we pumped that stuff. And so, you know, there was a lot of tactical challenges and, um, and, 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 and we would walk through towns, you know, we were, I mean, you can imagine how filthy we were. We, we, had, we walked through town, we had a dog. Uh, we didn't have any weapons. We got shot at once in Pennsylvania. I think it was more of a, um, I don't think they're really trying to hit us. I think they were just having a good time or something. But at any rate, you know, we would walk into town. We were like, damn, I feel like some pancakes, you know, cause we were eating pretty rough out there. And, and uh, you know, we'd find a diner and we put all the, the packs were heavy, 70 pound packs. Who's going to steal that, right? So we'd pile all the packs up, tie the dog to the packs, troop into the diner and, uh, and have ourselves a huge stack of pancakes and bacon and coffee and then go walk, file back outside and keep walking. And these are small towns. Within a few minutes, we're on the other side of town and back on the tracks. Yeah. That to me is an American experience. I mean, that is a, 
you know, that was what we were looking for. And, and we, you know, we would, we would have found other things on the Appalachian Trail, but, but not that. Yeah. You know, you mentioned uh, bringing a dog along a couple of times. And I wonder what's the, is, what's the relevance to that? I think you basically said in the book, you know, well, don't do this if you don't bring a dog along with you. Well, the, I mean, you know, the U.S. military, Stan can address this. The U.S. military uses dogs too. They, um, you know, their 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 um, collaboration with humans goes back 20, 30,000 years, I think. Uh, they are great at they they're light sleepers. I mean, a, a twig snaps. You're very vulnerable when you're asleep, right? And a twig snaps, and the dog's awake. And that dog, our dog. Like, like most dogs would die defending us. And, but mostly she was very, very alert. And uh, so having her there, I mean, we, you know, we were four pretty tough guys. Like I felt like we would handle just about anything out there except a guy with a gun. You know, at that point it kind of changes the equation. But, you know, one time we were dealing with the guy with the gun and I was like, you know what? He's not gonna take out Daisy and all of us. Like, I don't think he's gonna get past Daisy. And uh, so, it, you know, it just, it was very reassuring to have her, but also she was my dog. I loved her, you know, and, and she would go to sleep next to me. I put, you know, when we're out there in the winter, it was, you know, 15 degrees and we didn't have a tent or anything, right? We were out in the open. You know, I put her in the sleeping bag because it was so cold. And, and um, I say in the book, you know, God's, and I mean that mes- metaphorically, I'm an atheist, but I like metaphorically referring to God, I think is lovely. Uh, God's biggest mistake, biggest oversight was that dogs don't live as long as men. Yeah. The other big oversight is that men can't move as fast as dogs. <laughs> and, you know, what we could all could get up to if those two things were a little different, you know, what we could all get up, up to would be really quite extraordinary. Sure, sure. And I Stan, I, don't, I, I know as Sebastian says, the military makes some pretty brilliant uses of dogs at the time. And they, they, I think in the military too, they still remain man's best friend, right? They, they do. And we had dogs that I knew that had been wounded three times and been patched back up and stayed loyal to their team and whatnot. If, if I could violate the rules here, I'd like to ask Sebastian a question because Sebastian, when I listened to the account of this trip, what if, you know, what if you had gone alone without anyone else or with the dog, would it have been the same kind of psychological journey for you? Um, it would have been terrifying. It would have been terrifying, right? I mean, it's like combat would be terrifying by yourself. I mean, the ultimate fear, I think, of the soldiers I was with and of myself as well, is that somehow you would get separated from everybody else and be dealing with the Taliban on your own on those hillsides, right? And that turns the bravest person into, you know, potentially into a coward or into a very fearful, very, very fearful person and fearful for good reason, right? And so, you know, I think I, I think I would have been very paranoid and miserable. And one of the things I loved about the experience was the sense of interdependence, the interreliance of me and guys who were very, very quickly became my brothers. I mean, by the end of the day, if, depending on what you're doing, by the end of the day, the people w- you're with are your brothers, right? Depending on how, what the hell that day is going, right? And we walked 400 miles and I love those guys. You know, I would, in that sense, it was like combat. I would have done anything for them, you know? And um, um, I, so I think what I would have lost is the exhilarating sense that together we can face any odds, we can do anything. By myself, it would have felt like, wow, I'm really vulnerable out here. Out here and this, this, isn't that fun? Like, I, I just hope I'm okay at the end of this. Like, um, I, I could have done it, you know, but um, particularly without a dog, I don't know. That, I, I, I would have, I'm, I'm not, I, I, I did it in order to connect to other people, not to, um, you know, be, basically live the life of a, um, uh, I don't know, a hermit. Yeah. Hey, Stan, I don't want you to worry about rules. Jump in anytime you like this. It's a, it's a free for all. We don't get this opportunity much with somebody like Sebastian. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, Sebastian if, um, 
the wilderness territory. Again, you know, as I was saying it, I felt it was a little bit like a Lewis and Clark experience in the modern day. But you talk about in the book something, a term I'd never heard before, and, and it was called, this is from the frontier days, tomahawk rights. I, can you explain that? And then I'd like to know if you think there is any place left on this earth where that concept could still possibly exist. Well, okay, so tomahawk rights were along the Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania frontier, um, and the gateway to that was, was, was Harrisburg. Uh, at, just above Harrisburg, you run into the first set of uh, unnavigable shallow shallow water waterfalls. Not, they're not quite waterfalls, but they're but the, 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 you could not get a boat past Harrisburg, and uh, so that meant that easy access to the interior stopped at Harrisburg. That was the jumping off point for what was called Indian Territory. And so guys would go in there, and often in, in advance of their families, people that were hoping to homestead. And they would go in and suss out a nice spot and they would blaze trees with their initials. It had no legal right. I mean, they had no, it didn't give them legal right. They hadn't paid for the property. There was no one to pay. It wasn't even owned by any Western authority, right? It was just Indian territory. Uh, but they would put their initials on it. And that meant it was theirs. And it meant it was theirs in the sense that when people came later, they would pay if they wanted to buy if they wanted that piece of property. They would e they would either keep walking and find somewhere else, or they would pay to own that property because they knew some man had been there before and he was now a local, right? He was established somewhere, and newcomers didn't want to have trouble with the locals, right? And these were tough people, right? These were people you wanted to have a problem with. So even though there was no legal right to this property. The newcomers would often pay a nominal fee, I'm sure, for it, and uh, and then settle there. And it's, but the, the the you know the deeds, the, the the property claims in in that area of Pennsylvania, you can imagine they're a mess because you can't really trace them back to anything, any firm legal foundation. Um, does that op I mean, is that applicable anywhere else? Well, yeah, I mean, any place that's sort of outside of the rule of law, um, people can make claims that can claim territory. They don't have a legal right to it, to it, but if you're fearful enough of the repercussions, you will treat it as if it was theirs. We, north of William, uh, um, north, north of Wilmington, uh, Delaware, we ran into a really hardcore criminal motorcycle gang. It was one of the one of the very first African American motorcycle gangs in the country. They'd taken over an abandoned factory that, you know, it was a sort of little compound they had. They were outside. They were all armed to the teeth. Uh, there were multiple, I looked it up later. There were multiple shootings. I mean, the place where we stood talking to these guys, um, you know, people were shot and killed like at the gate where we were talking to them and they were friendly to a point. We needed water. We were out of water. And, and, uh, and then I realized it was about to turn and mm. we sort of got out of there before it turned, but, um, did they was did we treat that place? Did they pay for that place? No, of course not. They were a criminal motorcycle gang. They were cooking meth in the back, right? Mm -hmm. Did we treat it as if it was theirs? You bet we did, right? So yeah, tomahawk rights of a sort, absolutely. Yeah, neat. Stan, you're next. Yeah, I I think there's the other thing that uh, Sebastian mentioned in the book, and that was if someone didn't carry a rifle and a tomahawk, they really lost their place in society. They weren't doing what was expected of them. And there's not the exact uh, parallel in our society today, but you go to a place like Yemen, it's, it's pretty close to that and other places. So how we look at our responsibilities, what we have to do to meet what people's expectations are of us, it, it gets a little at it bounding in our individual freedoms because we've got to meet expectations that others set. But, but largely they are things that get built over time culturally. And there's a pretty good reason for most of them. So there's still a fair amount of that. It's just not quite so overt as the long rifle and tomahawk in your belt anymore. Yeah, I, 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 let's talk about the concept of uh, an American. Like in, in your book, Sebastian, you, you, uh, you wrote uh, the, at the, of, the, of Americans who lived during these times, the westward expansion, uh, you say the risks were appalling and the hardships 
unspeakable, but no government official would ever again tell you what to do. We are different Americans today, are we not? We, um, we might really feel that way, but these people actually had to really, really live that way. Yeah, and, and, and you know, it came at a, at a high cost of, uh, of suffering and, and, and mortality. I mean, you know, the mortality was horrific in those days on the Pennsylvania frontier and, and on the American frontier all the way across the nation. I mean, um, one of the interesting things I found, well, you know, forget about the, 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 the fight with the natives, which was bloody enough, but you put enough guys in one town um, and they'll murder each other. I mean, they'll murder each other at a higher rate than the native peoples ever could achieve. Right. They could have only dreamed of, of that kind of kill rate. Right. I mean, there was one railroad town in I think it was Wyoming. I forget the name. Um, and, and, you know, there's a very, very close correlation um, between violence and a male majority population. The, 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 the higher, the more off balance the ratio between men and women, the higher the level of violence. And of course, there was very little law enforcement there as well. Um, you know, you take law enforcement out of an equation, violence will go up, uh, particularly if it's a if it's a predominantly male environment. Um, as the gender imbalance equalizes, uh, which inevitably it would on the frontier, it was almost all men. And then, you know, within a generation, sort of women would catch up, they'd have families, it gets closer to 50-50 and the violence goes down. But in this one town, this uh, railroad town, um, they, 7% of the town, I mean, basically, 7% of the town were murdered. They murdered each other, right? 7% mortality in the first, I think, three months, right? I mean, at that rate, they would have basically killed all of each other within, you know, a year or so. I mean, it was, or a few years, I forget the math. Um, that, that's, um, that level of violence is also a, a, a lack of freedom. So these guys were enormously free on the frontier, right? There wasn't a tech... There, there wasn't a sheriff for 100 miles, right? 200, 500 miles, whatever, enormously free. But their lives were in danger. They, I mean, they were killing each other, like, you know, like every day they were dumping the corpses out in the desert because they were killing each other so fast. So, so you know, it's like, pick your poison and you don't get it all. You don't get to be perfectly safe and perfectly free at the same time. It's not possible. Yeah. You know, you said there was, you, you all, the four of you, I know different people at different times, but you had a rule in which you said, we're not going to take anything from anyone. Maybe water, but, but that's about it. Someone offered a walking staff at some point and you turned it down. What, why that rule? Oh, we just felt it would, it would keep it simpler. Um, you know, this guy, I mean, I sort of thought of it at the moment because he was being generous. He was a man, it was a very you know, it was a rural town in Pennsylvania, and he was a Vietnam vet, and he made um, walking staffs out of uh, strangle vine that would sort of, you know, into, like go up a, 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 a sapling or whatever, and he would, he, and he would cut, he would free the, the, the vine part, and it would harden, and it was, there were extraordinary sort of corkscrew shapes, um, and I just, I sort of thought about, you know, we're out here out of choice. We've saved up the money. We have the money to do this. Um, what, we can't really accept generosity uh, that's going to cost the, the giver more than we need it, right? Like we needed water. We did need water. We needed good advice. In that town, actually, they had a, uh, a water alert. The water, the, the um, water supply had been tainted. And uh, so he, so we had to we had to walk out of town and get our water out of a creek and uh, and boil it. Um, but um, it just seemed it just seemed like eth ethical to keep the exchanges on a very simple level. Yeah, I wonder if by in some way if by accepting something from someone um, you lost freedom in a sense. You became obligated to them. But um, it, it sounds like maybe it wasn't that that complex. Well, look, I mean, reciprocity and the collabor you know, collab I mean, if you're in a group and you're collaborating and you have a reciprocal arrangement with other people, I mean, look, the plumber comes, he fixes my pipes, I give him some money. That's reciprocity, right? Um, am I less free than if I knew how to, than I knew how to fix, fix a broken pipe? Yeah, a little less free, right? 
But what are you gonna, I mean, you can't know everything, right? And that's the beauty of being in a society. You don't need to know everything. There's people that do stuff better than you ever can. And you're in this web of relationships. I think there's very few people in this country and I'm certainly not one of them where if you picked them up and dropped them in the wilderness, they'd be alive a week later. Very, very few people. We are not free. We depend on each other. But my God, that's an ancient human situation. That goes back 100,000 years, right? Like mm -hmm. there's no dishonor there. So you, you really have to sort of understand that your freedom uh, in a more in a deeper sense means that a, 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 an outside power cannot tell you how to live and what your values are and what you owe them, right? Only your own community can do that, right? And that's a reciprocal agreement. I mean, that's a collective agreement of what we all owe. And it's very, very important that our leaders are part of that reciprocity and that they are not exempt from the law, not exempt from taxes, not exempt from moral scrutiny, and preferably that they be the kind of leaders. And I saw these kind of leaders all the time in the US military. You don't see it quite so much in politics, but they're the kind of leaders who would at a moment's notice, subject themselves to the same consequences, the same risks uh, as, as, as the people that they lead. That's how you know a real leader and, and, and a leader that hides, basically hides behind the people that, that he or she is charged with taking care of, hides behind them, literally from bullets or metaphorically from accountability. That's not a leader, that's an opportunist. And they're very easy to tell apart and this, this country deserves leaders in that by that definition. Yeah. Now, let me jump on that because I became first became, you know, a follower of Sebastian with his amazing work in Afghanistan, which of course I have experienced as well. And, and you're kind to, to refer to the military there, but we also something in, saw in Afghanistan that wasn't unique, but corruption. And when you get a situation where an official essentially has to buy their position, and then there is this uh, perverse relationship where they must do the bidding of hire and whatnot. They, they've essentially bought some power and maybe some wealth and they've mortgaged their freedom, their freedom of action. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. And, and you know, there's a very close correlation um, between corruption and uh, religious extremism. I mean, the, you know, I mean, I was in Afghanistan in 1996 when the Taliban, right when the Taliban were taken over. I mean, I was, I was in, you know, the outskirts of Kabul and a, and a Taliban gunner opened up on me with a PKM, right? And, um, and the, the guy that I was with, he was a Pashtun kid, right? And the Taliban were majority Pashtun, right? He was a Pashtun kid. He said, you know, we hate those people, the Taliban. We hate them, but we're going to let them in because corruption is killing this country. And they promised to clean up the corruption. So we don't have to live in fear of every police checkpoint and every corrupt official. They're brutal, they're awful, the Taliban, but at least they're not corrupt. And one of the, I think, big um, errors that the US made, uh, they made a lot of good choices, but one, you know, a choice that I, I think was unfortunate is they did not focus, they didn't, we didn't seem to focus on the, the corruption part of it. And there was a lot of money sloshing around in Afghanistan and some of it wound, you know, American money, some of it wound up in bad hands and it just reinforced the idea among the Afghans that, that you know, the, the Americans, you know, you know, they thought we were paying the Taliban, right? I mean, they had this idea we were actually paying the Taliban and that we were all in sort of league. And, um, you know, obviously you can't win a war when the people you're helping, trying to help think that you're in collusion with the enemy. That's just not going to work. Yeah, I, and uh, on, on this topic, uh... And Stan, I think you're probably the world's leading authority on the answer to this. Um, it's, Sebastian wrote, um, a relatively small number of Taliban insurgents fought the most powerful military in the world to a standstill, and a prior generation of Afghans did the same thing to the Soviet Union. Um, I th and, and Sebastian, I think, was... was uh, talking about you know, when, a, when an organization, a nation, a country, an army gets to be of a certain size, the logistics and everything that's involved in supporting a community of that size, make, in some respects, makes it, gives it a handicap versus a smaller cohesive unit. Can you talk about that in the concept of freedom? 
It, it, it's absolutely correct. Uh, with all good intentions, big militaries put in place doctrine and rules. For example, uh, when I was there with special operations earlier, there was a rule that every soldier had to wear every piece of body armor that they were issued. And if, if you uh, had a soldier who was killed or wounded, you had to report as part of the casualty reporting what body armor they were wearing at that moment. And you know, we had, to, if you've seen the movie Lone Survivor, where they had the problem at 12,000 feet and, and we sent forces after them, you don't wear body armor and go to 12,000 feet and move very well. And so it was good intentions, but it was counterproductive. I would say in the broader sense, what you describe though is really our mindset is what hurts us most. It's the mindset of how we are going to address the problem. And as, as Sebastian correctly said, for expediency, not because we were ill-intended, but expediency, you often work with corrupt entities because they can get something done. And that, that undermines your uh, relationship or credibility with the people. Similarly, you do certain tactics that seem to make a lot of sense, like drop a lot of bombs because you can get at the enemy but there's a cost to every action like that. And so I think that uh, big militaries tend to operate in ways that are familiar and seem to be efficient in the moment. But in an environment like that, proximity to the people, which is what the Taliban enjoy, even though they're not hugely popular, right. um, they have physical and cultural proximity and they leverage that brilliantly. And so I think that uh, it's really a case of, of us just not thinking enough in, in my view. Yeah. Yeah. They, and, you know, just to add another sort of level to that, um, large organizations burn through a disproportionate amount of resources compared to a small organization. It, it doesn't scale up well. Right. And there's an exact analogy with, you know, one-on-one -on -one physical combat. I looked at mixed martial arts and boxing and, you know, if you have a, um, you know, a small guy fighting a large guy, there's an, the small guy is an obvious disadvantage, right? Strength and size can dominate in the fight, but they come with a cost and there's a strange um, advantage to being small as well. Small moves more quickly. I mean, you just have less mass to set in motion, right? It's easier for a 150 pound guy to slip, slip a punch than a 300 pound guy, right? There's just less mass to put in motion. And you're, you're, those big muscles use up a lot of oxygen. And so if the big guy doesn't win a fight pretty quickly, um, he pretty soon can be just too winded to actually really function very well. And so there's an exact analogy, you know, with the Taliban, like basically the small guy doesn't have to win. He just has to not lose long enough so that the, the big entity, either the you know big military or the big dude is, is out of air, out of commitment, out of enthusiasm, out of patience, whatever it is. And you know, if you you know, if, if you have that kind of fight in a shower stall, the big guy's gonna win because the small guy just can't maneuver. There isn't any room to maneuver. If we were fighting the Taliban in, in an area the size of Rhode Island, we would have won, right? It's not you know, we know that, right? But we were on one of the wildest areas of the world, the, the Afghan-Pakistan border, right? That's a nightmare, tactically. And, um, and we didn't come on really big and really strong at the beginning. We had a very light footprint. And, uh, you know, most of our resources and assets w uh, went, went to Iraq. And, you know, the Afghans watched that. You know, I was there in 2000 when Massoud was fighting the Taliban. I was there in 2001 after Massoud was killed when his commanders were fighting the Taliban. And they watched America. They're like, basically go off to Iraq. And, and they were like, what, are you kidding? This isn't gonna work. So, you know, the fact that they were um, tentative in their loyalty to us, um, you know, sort of makes sense, right? Because there's gonna be hell to pay for them if we ever leave. And that's exactly what we're doing now. You know, and I'm throwing a term out there, but when, when people talk to me about asymmetric warfare, the tactical part, which we talk about most often, I also say asymmetric warfare has to do with asymmetric motivation too. The Taliban are going to be there before we, you know, they were there before we came. They're going to be there after we leave. They got nowhere else to go. They are more invested in the outcome than we can ever be, as were the North Vietnamese and the Viet Cong. 
you can't match them in how invested they are into the effort. And so unless you can do something amazing, it's pretty hard to, to overcome that. Yeah, and um, I, I don't want to draw any uh, you know, you know, equivalency between the Taliban and, uh, let's say, the American Indians, but I, I've, I found your book, Sebastian, you know, you, you get into this uh, as, uh, as manifest destiny took hold and the white man moves west, you know, there, there are the, probably the freest Americans that there ever were called Indians. And, and you focused in on the Apaches, which I think uh, Stan has, um, has delved into as, he, as he's looked at uh, combat and warfare. But um, here's an example where uh, a, civil, a community, a civilization, uh, <laughs> they had what they had and they were going to fight. But, but this one took 100 years. And it, it, in this case, a bigger army um, you know, was able to sweat it out. And, and, and win the, uh, you know, win the War of the West. But these people, uh, the Apaches were light and maneuverable and quick in their tactics. I mean, these guys were free and they were fighting for something that would, I mean, it was the ultimate of freedom, it seemed to me. Yeah, but it's very interesting. You know, there was a, uh, the Apache were in the American Southwest and they enjoyed the same kind of relationship with an international border that the Taliban do, right? Like they were, they would ride that border between Mexico and Arizona, uh, and Arizona and New Mexico, and you know the U.S. military couldn't necessarily chase them down there, right? So, uh, at any rate, there was a whole other equivalent tribal society down there at the same time, the, the Pueblo culture, right? And the Pueblo were much wealthier because they were agriculturalists. They weren't nomads, right? They were agriculturalists. They uh, and they lived in very, very solid towns on top of mesas. The towns looked like towns you might find, might have found in medieval Spain. Um, and the Spanish showed up in the late 1500s and, and you know rolled them up immediately, right? And, and they didn't stand a chance against the Spaniards. That it took the Spaniards and then eventually the Americans another 300 years to fully um, control the Apache because they were mobile. Uh, and they were mobile because they were poor, right? They were materially poor. Uh, they, they were so mobile that they, the children would sleep with food tied around their waists at night if the enemy was near, in case they had to jump up in the middle of the night and start running into the canyons. Uh, the, Apa the, uh, the Apache warriors in rough terrain could move faster than cavalry. They were expected to be able to cover 70 miles a day on foot, right? For, for multiple days in a row. Uh, even, even cavalry on horseback had trouble with that. So, so it was their mobility that gave them their freedom. And you know, my, my book is divided into three sections, run, fight, and think. Uh, the, first, the first section focuses on the Apache because that's how they maintain their freedom. Yeah. Uh, Stan, did you say, I, I think I'm correct in that um, a lot of your studies, a lot of your writings have focused in on the, the strength of the small unit and cohesive units, and you, I think, looked backwards to examples like the Apaches. Isn't that right? We absolutely do. That's exactly what I focused on in small elite teams. And the problem, of course, is scaling. As Sebastian says, the Apaches were effective tactically because they were poor and they were light and they were focused and they weren't trying to control terrain or build something that would build them wealth. That was also their weakness because they couldn't, they couldn't have created an empire. And when we talk about the, uh, the army defeating the Native American tribes in the United States, it was piece by piece. You know, many of the Native American tribes defeated each other, but then they were broken up in fact, had they truly been a united, cohesive whole, then it would have been probably a much more difficult challenge over time. Sure. Uh, Sebastian, I don't, I don't know when you started your walks, um, how many years ago it might have been, but it, the book sure see, and the, the journey seems to have brought itself to a point um, where it ended right at the right time because the, what America seems to have been facing this last year with this pandemic seems to be to be the ultimate 
uh, battle between freedom and community. You know, it should, do I have to wear a mask? Why do I have to wear a mask? Uh, do I, it, th this is really at the heart of this great American divide right now. Is it not this battle between community and one's obligation to a community versus one's individual freedom and uh, self-reliance? Yeah, I, mean, I think you're right, but I, you know, I think I should point out that um, you know, as, as a journalist, I try to stay really politically agnostic and point out the, 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 the um, virtues and the flaws of both sides and, and, and they're bountiful, both are bountiful on both sides. But that said, I think had the leadership, the political leadership, uh, when, the, when, the, um, when COVID hit this country, um, had it really come forward with a strong message that um, these pretty these pretty simple um, uh, standards like wearing a mask, keeping a social distance, that they were in a sense a kind of patriot a form of patriotism that was that it was all of us individually looking out for our fellow Americans. Had th had that message come down from the leadership, I think the people in this country that are resistant to wearing a mask. Uh, and you can argue, you can talk to them all day long about the medical sort of logic of that, but we're really in a cultural realm here. And had the, 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 the political leadership set the tone culturally of what wearing a mask means as an American, that it's, uh, it means you love your country and, and you don't want your fellow Americans to die. Um, it might've been very different. It might've been a, wearing a mask might've been wearing an American flag on your, on your lapel. Right, it might have been the equivalent of that, as as a lot of people did after 9/11. Um, you know, I think the leadership panicked at the prospects of an economic collapse and tried to pretend the, that COVID wasn't really a threat, and then the whole thing fell apart. So, I, I, I don't want to I don't want to blame the American populace too much on this. I think we assume our leadership has our best interests at, at in heart at heart, and I don't think. And this is true of both political parties. I'm not sure that's necessarily always true. Yeah, and instead it was construed like a, you know, example of wearing a mask was like, it's a, it's a theft of my freedom, right? And that's the last thing you want to do to an American, right? Is put them in a corner like that. Right. A, a, good, a strong message from the top would have disabused everyone of that idea. It's a silly idea. Just like, you know, you know, having to stop at red lights is a theft of my freedom. It's complete nonsense, in my opinion. Yeah, and it, um, it also brings up the notion, you know, that too much freedom can kill, literally, can it not? I mean, uh, uh, too much freedom is chaos, and chaos versus the community is it's a big deal. Yeah, I mean, that's why humans, you know, we're social primates. You know, we live in groups that have rules. Chimpanzees do too, right? I mean, you know... You, there's a social organization that is designed to keep everyone as safe and healthy uh, and, you know, as comfortable or affluent as possible. And uh, it may be that the, the rules of the group are feel onerous to you. It may be that the government's rules are, you know, feel petty and overly controlling. Well, either change them through the many processes that are on offer, uh, <laughs> the, cor the courts, the ballot box, either change them you know, or go to Somalia. I mean, you know, seriously, in Somalia, there are places where you know one's going to tell you what to do. It's exactly like the Juniata River in 1740. Like the risks are huge, but you know, you know, you can wear, you can carry any kind of gun you want, and no one's going to tell you to wear a mask and whatever else. You know, so you know that's you claiming your freedom. If you stay within this society, freedom is really a, a, a the wrong word. We are really talking about our rights, not freedom. Freedom is the wrong word for that situation. Uh, rights is really what you're talking about. And you do not give yourself rights. Society, your rights are given by the community to the individual. You know, you're, you're, you're late for your, that cast the plane to your daughter's wedding and you're rushing into the security line and it's a hundred people long. You do not have, you can't give yourself the right to cut the line and go to the front. What you can do is say, hey everybody, my daughter's getting married tomorrow. I'm about to miss my flight. Would you allow me to go first? And I'm guessing the line will give you that right, right? They'll say, yes, of course, congratulations, right? Rights come from your community. They, they are not self-given. Yeah, Stan, how is this concept dealt with in the military? You know, asking someone to go out there and to 
put their very life on the line and at the same time restricting or holding back their freedoms? Well, it's a trade-off. Uh, and particularly in very elite forces where you pay a price to be in that force, it is inconvenient, it can be physically difficult, it asks a lot of your sta you standards-wise, but in return, you get the protection of the group, you also get the satisfaction of being part of the group. You're sitting, I understand, in the Reagan Library. I'm told that President Reagan would never go into the Oval Office not wearing a suit because he thought that's what he owed it because he had the privilege of that job. Now, nobody was going to tell him he couldn't have gone in wherever he wanted, wearing whatever he wanted. But he understood intuitively that we have inalienable responsibilities. And I think uh, we shouldn't forget those. Sure. Yeah. It's interesting. Uh, you raised President Reagan in this conversation, Stan, because uh, when his centennial took place several years ago, the 100th anniversary of his birth, we did a lot of research and studies and we asked the American people, it was like a word association game. You know, if you think of George Washington, okay, father of our country, when you think of Abraham Lincoln, freed the slaves, and so, okay, open question, when you think of Ronald Reagan, what do you think? 90% of the time, freedom. <laughs> uh, you know, that, that's, what, that's the word that people associated with Reagan, and I always found it interesting, you know, here is a guy who was all about freedom around the world, freedom for the individual, but at the same time, he sat at the head of a, as the head of a government. And government involves community and responsibility and obligation to each other. So it's always this constant balancing act uh, that I think you struck a chord in with your with your book, Sebastian. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is freedom essential to human dignity? Uh, freedom from oppression is essential. Um, there are lots of uh, forms of not being free. I mean, if you if you hold a mortgage on your house and you got to go to work every day, um, you know your 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 freedom to do whatever you want with your time clearly has been diminished. But your human dignity hasn't been diminished. What dimin diminishes human dignity is uh, is oppression, and oppression by people who are using their 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 power to um, advance their own interests at the at the cost of yours. Um, I, you know, I I, I think the um, Physical courage is a very, very important part, and moral courage is a very, very important part of proper leadership. Um, and when it's lacking, um, I think things don't go very well in a society. Yeah, can I ask a question is uh, to bring something, you know, quite contemporaneously into the, the, the talk here. It's this controversy over defunding the police. And I, I just, I raise it because I saw some connections to some of the themes you were striking, Sebastian, where um, you, you say freedom first and foremost is the absence of fear. And as I thought about that, I thought, you know, here's uh, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. And um, if you're African American, you know, for you, when you see the police, that's what you fear. And when the law and order or typical white American looks at that, they see the police and they see it as being safety. And it's, it's like, this is where the ultimate collision is taking place. Uh, radically different views as to what community or law and order means to, to each side of things. Oh, absolutely. I completely agree. I, I, and, I, you know, it's, you can make a very good case that particularly for young African-American men, that the police to them uh, represent more of a threat than a, 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 um, than a, a form of protection. Um, now, we, you know, I think, I mean, I'm not an expert on this at all, but um, I'm guessing that if you, if you take all the police out of African-American communities, of course, deaths at the hands of police officers will go down to zero because there just aren't any there. Um, but I'm guessing that um, homicides in those areas might creep up, which is another form of a loss of freedom. Uh, so, uh, you know, like, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky balance. At the end of the day, you know, there's good policing, there's bad policing, and then there's no policing. And I, I, I think 
when people say defund the police, I'm not even quite sure technically what they mean, like no police anywhere in America. I'm, I'm not sure they mean that, but maybe they do. I mean, it's not clear to me. Um, but I, you know, I think when people say that, basically what they're saying is we have tried to reform the police for years, for decades. The police unions themselves often stand in the way of even egregious justice for egregious cases of abuse. We have given up. You can't reform yourselves, fine then we're not going to fund you. Now, is, will the outcome be good in terms of lives saved? I, I don't know. I mean, I, who knows? But I think I understand where the, um, the emotions behind that slogan come from. Steve, you have a view on this? Yeah, it's the same as Sebastian's. My family is split on my, uh, on one side, it's from the, uh, a military family. My mother's family was from the deep south. And I think about Bull Connor in Birmingham, Alabama. And I think about the different experiences you have with power, police being one manifestation of power. And your perspective can be very different. I think there are communities across our nation that still have experiences that are negative enough where you want significant change. And I, I agree. I don't think people are really serious about defunding the police or doing away with the police. But I think pretty significant change is is warranted in many cases. Yeah, we just have a couple more minutes, so I, I'll keep it brief. But I, um, Sebastian, you divided your book into these three core concepts, as you said: you know, run, fight, and think. All verbs, uh, action words associated with the word freedom. I wonder, did, did you wrestle with trying to distill? it down into those three concepts. Are there other verbs that you um, might well add to that list if you'd written a longer book? Um, you know, what else can be associated with the concept of freedom in that, in that realm? Um, yeah, there's a fourth chapter I could have written. I didn't feel like I had the um, intellectual horsepower to do it properly. Um, the last one would have been feel, feel. You can be in prison and feel free. There are levels of spiritual freedom, philosophical freedom um, that uh, can be achieved no matter what your physical circumstances. I talked to a guy, you know, my conversation with him didn't make it into the book, um, but I just because I wasn't, I'm not a good enough writer to have incorporated his amazing thoughts in a seamless way. But I can, uh, you know, I, I, I can talk about them, and, and and you know, he had did done, he had done decades in prison for, uh, you know, committing a very serious crime, obviously. And uh, when he was very young, he grew up in, in horrendous circumstances. He was a product of his circumstances, and he made a huge mistake, and he paid the price for it. He paid his debt. Uh, but I asked him at the end. He was he really eventually released on good behavior. Uh, he, amazing man. He educated himself. Extraordinary man. Absolutely extraordinary. Unbelievably smart read every book he could get his hands on, beautiful person. And I said, hey, one last question. At the end of our conversation, I was like, I feel silly asking this, but is it possible to be more free in prison than outside of prison? He was like, are you kidding? Of course it is. You can't be an addict in prison and you're not distracted by anything. And distractions, you know, the iPhone, the, 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 the television, the, 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 you know, whatever, people's people, you know, whatever, Distractions take you from yourself and your ultimate freedom is being connected to yourself and working on yourself and being honest with who you, with yourself about who you are. And it's very hard to be honest about who you are when you're distracted the way everybody is on the outside. In prison, there is nothing to distract you. And eventually, eventually you will be completely honest with yourself. And that's the highest form of freedom. And the only place that he knew where he could achieve that was in prison. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> well put. Um, Stan, any closing comments? Yeah, I think there was a fourth section of the book and it, it overarched all of them. And it, it really goes through Sebastian's life. It's commit because he's committed himself to veterans. He's committed himself to his, his friends he walked with. He's committed himself to causes. And so you have to pull that thread through, but it came through loud and clear for me. And I love the book. Thank you very, very much, sir. I've loved, I'm so thrilled that you liked it. Yeah, and uh, Stan, obviously, the very same uh, generosity of words can be said about you and your entire career. And 
the leadership you provided to the United States military and to the country as a whole. So uh, both of you, really, thank you so, so much. What a, what a terrific contribution to uh, the, the discussion in America today. I'm so, so glad that I read it, and I'm so glad to spend a few minutes with the two of you. My honor. Thank you so much, both of you guys. Amazing conversation. Take care. Thank you for joining us for today's virtual programming event. We hope this conversation has inspired you to share what you've learned with your family and friends, and that you'll join us again for an upcoming event. And let me offer lesson number one about America. All great change in America begins at the dinner table. So tomorrow night in the kitchen, I hope the talking begins. And children, if your parents haven't been teaching you what it means to be an American, let them know and nail them on it. That would be a very American thing to do.